Kilamakamna. Good after. Good morning, um, John. Thank you for opening us up in such a good way. I'm feeling very excited and honored and a little bit nervous because it's such an amazing opportunity to come together for three days and to really open up this space of wellness and well-being to the elders in the room and those who have um, lit the torch and helped guide us. I, I honor you today in the Denaina people and the land that we stand on and this gathering place of all of our cultures. It's such a great opportunity to to bring healing into the room and to be grounded. And so I'm really deeply honored to be here today and to help facilitate the panel that we're going to be having. I just want to open us up with a few words. And for those that don't know me, <clears throat> I'm Gary Ferguson. And um, <clears throat> I see lots of new faces. And I'm really excited about that as we look at this journey of well-being. And 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago now, I finished um, my doctorate in naturopathic medicine and came home and went to work. And the terrain was a lot different a little over 20 years ago when we started talking about wellness and prevention and some of the concepts. Um, there have been waymakers. I see hope over here. And those who have been sitting at the table for a long time saying, how do we actually do well-being and wellness? And how do we focus on wellness? And we've made a lot of gains. We have a lot to celebrate. And, and I want us to focus on that. Sometimes we can get into deficit-based thinking. <laughs> including ourselves. It's just like we look at our own lives and we look at the loss. And I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of loss over the last couple of years. And so if we were to get into that space of the deficit, it can be this dark place, right? And, and all of us who are in this wellness journey, it's like we also have to, to feed that fire within ourselves to keep our well-being. And as I think about my own journey, um, of well-being and wellness, and I, I took one of the ribbons um, to remind me. This is uh, yellow is my mother's favorite color, Kristen Ferguson, and um, she blessed me with amazing hope and joy. And for those of you that got to know her, she was at the hospital a lot for, especially for quite a few years, and so she blessed many of us with this incredible optimism. And I feel like I get to carry that as well. It's, it's in my genetic structure, thank God for my mother. Um, and my ancestors who I honor today, I, I honor Emil and Marina Gunderson, my grandparents from Sanak Island and Sandpoint, and Hilton and Clara Ferguson from the East Coast from upstate New York. And the fact that I got to be connected to both sets of grandparents. I feel so lucky to have had that. I have those memories. And, and to me, that created a sense of place and well-being and to know who I am and where I come from. And Dr. Rita Blumenstein, who I want to bring into the room and, and as our ancestor now, and the amazing wisdom that she has shared with us. Um, I'll share a quote here in just a minute. But I, I feel like we've had these amazing bright spirits who are now with us. You know, in, in Dr. Rita's perspective, she's not here with us physically, but she's here with us spiritually for sure. And that wisdom that she brought me and many of us who have been influenced by her and inspired by her, um, we get to carry that forward and that wisdom, that light, that joy, that perspective. And um, she, uh, she shares, the past is not a burden. It is a scaffold which brought us to this day. We are free to be who we are, to create our own life out of our past and out of our present. We are ancestors. When we can heal ourselves, we also heal our ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and our children. When we heal ourselves, we heal Mother Earth. She also shares, to heal is to become ourselves, to become the light within. It is to accept ourselves and what we feel, and in doing so, accept others. It is to be a real person. Profound wisdom as we think of you know, this earth and climate change and the things that we're, our next generation is facing. And I have the honor of raising up a little boy. His name is George Martin. He's three. 
and I share way too much on Facebook um, about photos, but I tell you what, um, he brings joy, and I want him to know that, and I want him to know that he's valued and loved and cherished, right? Our next generation needs to know that they're cherished. And uh, that's how we're going to make a difference for our next generation. And the generations that follow is that we hold them in the highest good, our next generation. And we've been taught, and many of us have wounds and trauma in our family systems weren't necessarily healthy. And when we think of our ancestors, many of them had wounds that were inflicted upon them that they didn't have the opportunity to heal in their lifetime. And, and as Dr. Rita shares, we get to be the healing through our life and through our next generation, the influence that we get to have on our next generation and the children's and the children's children that will follow. So we get to be that healing that my grandparents didn't get to have because they didn't have the same terrain. The terrain has shifted. We're talking about things that we haven't talked about and it's about time. Dr. Rita also shared many things and she says, we're sick because we don't talk about it. We need to talk about it, but we need to talk about it in a way that is, is bringing us forward in healing rather than just ruminating on the deficit. We need to talk about things with the intent to heal. So we're going to have some wonderful wisdom shared um, this morning, and I'm really honored to help facilitate um, Sally Swetsoff, one of the elders from my, my home region, Amunanga. Um, she gave me the name, and uh, Crystal Dushkin, her daughter, um, Kagu, which means healing. And I got that as an adult, and to me, I, f I take that, that name seriously, that I get to be that healing, and, and I also get to do it in my own life, right? I feel like we, we heal ourselves, and through healing ourselves, we sit in a place where we get to, to help others to heal themselves. And I feel like it begins with us. Healing begins with me, with us, in our family system. And the challenges that many of us grew up with, we get to heal those. It starts with us. And um, the panel today will be um, having a couple of questions, but it's going to be a talk story format of, of healing and well-being and wellness and prevention. I had the honor of being the first director of wellness and prevention at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium with the board leadership that said, we want to focus on wellness and prevention rather than just focusing in on disease. And it was a powerful move by incredible leaders. And that has persisted and that's changed. Many of us have worked together through that position and when I was at the consortium. That took visionary leadership. And the blessings that we have now as a result, we get to share. We get to take it to the next level. We're gonna have culturally based curricula and, and things that are about culture as medicine shared this afternoon. That's a powerful statement. Culture is medicine. The work that the Center for Alaska Native Health Research in, in the researchers that worked in our communities and the elders that informed that research to understand that our way of being as Native people, as, as thriving cultures, help create well-being for our future. As we reclaim our dance, as we reclaim our connection, right? We all had a name for creator prior to, to colonization to reconnect that spiritual well-being, right? We have, many of us have cultural amnesia, spiritual amnesia because of the wounding that we had from people who were good intentioned, some, and at the same time, it's about healing. It's about a way forward and the beauty of what was brought to us. For those of us who come from cultures um, in my region, we have Scandinavian music and polka, and you know, you travel a little bit further north and you have fiddling, and these things that in the end bring together the colonized perspective and the things that are, are beautiful, right? We get to take that and turn it into good, even though some of it came with pain. The beauty of memory is that as we reactivate the memory and the connection to the land, to our ancestors and to each other, we get to awaken. And as Johan so powerfully started us and, and um, the words that were shared by our um, co-hosts, 
that helped ground us. And we're going to have an amazing three days together. I'm really, really honored to be here today. And, and I'm going to invite um, our speakers. So we're going to have Elizabeth Ripley, Chuck Shaka, and Christina Love um, come on up. And we have um, a talk story time for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So I'm, again, I'm really deeply honored to be here today and to help facilitate this conversation. So many amazing um, people that I've known for many years in the room and I've worked with you and a lot of new faces. And I really look forward to getting to meet you and to understand the work that you're doing and how we can together come together to, to take wellness and prevention in Alaska to the next level. So welcome. And I, I'm going to have you each introduce yourself in your way, and then we're going to get into our dialogue. So um, how about we start down with Elizabeth, can you introduce yourself, and then Christina and Chuck, please. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Ripley, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I was just reflecting, um, probably one of the last times I saw you, uh, Dr. Ferguson, we were in a meeting with Recover Alaska and we were talking about how to change social norms. And it was just so exciting. But to see what Recover has done through the Alliance and through this, this statewide effort that lifts um, different regions up, is just, it just blows my mind. So I just, <laughs> it's so good to see all of you and I'm, I'm just, um, I'm warmed by um, all the folks that I know that are out there that want to address this challenge called alcohol and, and move us forward into that recovery space. So um, I, uh, I, I'm from Maryland, but I have lived in Alaska longer than anywhere. I'm so grateful to, um, to, to, to live here and, um, and get to know Alaska's peoples and our beautiful land. And um, I have, uh, I'm the, my day job is I'm the president and CEO of the Matsu Health Foundation. My favorite role, though, is grandma to my uh, two-year-old grandson, Elias, who lives here in Anchorage, thank goodness. Koyana <laughs> uh, My name is Christina Love. My pronouns are she and her and mom. Um, um, I'm originally from um, Igigik Village in the Bristol Bay region. Um, I grew up in Chitna. Um, in the interior on Atna land, and today I live on Linket Ani, which is home to the Akantakukwan of the Clinket Nation. Very, very, very grateful, very honored um, to be here on Denina land. Um, I'm getting, I just immediately started to get very emotional thinking about <laughs> uh, what it means to be here. Um, I am staying at the Captain Colonizer Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never think of it as anything else. Um, do yourself a favor and, and research that history. It's, um, it's a really uh, fascinating story, the true story that we haven't been telling, which I think is part of what we're here to do, is to tell the truth, to tell the whole story, You know, to reconnect to our bodies, to reconnect to our story, to reconnect to our land. Um, and um, I was getting emotional thinking about it because um, um, on March 3rd um, will be 10 years of, of freedom for me. Um, but I, I, when I was walking by the coffee shop this morning, I remember I used to, uh, there's a door there over by the Women's Athletic Club. And when I was homeless here in Anchorage, I would sneak down there and I would stay in the bathroom to stay warm. <laughs> so it's a big moment to sit here on the couch and be able to share how I get to be here with all of you and that I get to be a mom and that I get to be a person um, who carries that ancestral knowledge and that wisdom in me. And um, of all of the things, I love that we're focusing on our strengths and, and telling that story um, because I think that, that that shift for me is what allows me to be free, what allows me to be comfortable in my body and um, what allows me to see um, the brilliance in people who um, are struggling wherever they are, that we get to call them up and that we get to remember as a community. I think is one of the, so many people know that indigenous people um, have experienced all of these different types of harm and we want them to know that that's what it means to be in trauma informed 
transformed, but that is not our identity. We are so much more than the harm that's happened to us. We are brilliant, and beautiful, creative, and I'm, I'm grateful and I'm honored um, to, um, for of all the things of, of who I am, that that is the identity that I get to lead with, that I am a person um, who knows what it means um, to recover, to overcome, and, um, and I carry with me that hope. Um, so my position that pays the taxes um, I, is with, and I think language is so important. Um, and so I use the language with instead of for um, because it's not onerous. I work alongside, I work with, I work for the, the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, my position is on intersectionality. And that just means that we can't talk about alcohol without talking about trauma, individual, um, cumulative, historical, and how that connects to homelessness. And um, so the other experiences that I have, um, contact with the criminal justice system, including incarceration, um, which is a great, well, um, I'll talk about it um, maybe a little bit later, but that um, I have all of this wisdom and knowledge and there's so many organizations that can't hire me because um, I have the experience of, of also being um, formerly incarcerated or as a felon. Um, so I'm very, very grateful fangirling to sit here on the stage um, with all of you and there's so many wonderful people in this room and I, um, I'm excited to share space with all of you. Koyana Gunstish. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's truly humbling to be up here with these amazing folks and just to be in this room in general. Uh, my name is Chuck Shaka. My family moved to Bethel when I was six months old from California, and I grew up out there. I was raised by my mom, Sally Russell, who worked at the therapeutic court there for for many years. Um, I went to Ayapkhonet Nagovic, which is the Yupik Immersion School in Bethel, um, and I was given the name Akhsawiak after Edward Okuchuk of Scandinavia. In Bay, and then I went on to, to graduate from high school there, um, and moved home after college and worked at the high school with with kids there for for a while. And I have been in Anchorage now for about four years, and I work for the Alaska Humanities Forum, which really is dedicated to the work of strengthening communities, and that when people come together to to work on their their own problems and are more connected and more relational, that a lot of the challenges as we see start to, to improve a little bit. Um, so I, I was gonna make the day job joke and then I was like, no, I, like, this is not just my day job. I'm doing this because I really, I really love doing it, not saying that you all don't. Um, but I, I thought about that same joke. So it, it truly is an, an honor to be here um, and I'm excited to, to share what, what I can in, in this space with you all. So we're going to get into some questions, um, but before we do, I, I didn't let you know what I'm currently doing. Um, so the last two years, a little over two years now, um, during the, the pandemic, we had George Martin and then the, the COVID hit. And so we had him for 16 months without having to go to daycare, which what a joy and a blessing. And I'm like, I, I had some European friends go, well, that's how we do it in Europe. It's just like, right? And of course, we don't do that here. It's just like we get right back to work again. Um, so I, I feel like I got to have this incredible experience and our children are our teachers. Um, they see things as it is. And we often learn to put up all kinds of fronts and be uncomfortable and not show it. And I just feel like we need to be more like our kids. We need to tell things as they are. We need to be honest. And so, with that in mind, I um, had this great opportunity to join Washington State University in the College of Medicine, a former uh, colleague who I worked with when I was at the consortium, Dr. Deja Buckwald, um, said, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm raising a kid and uh, thinking about when I'm gonna go back to work again. It's probably not gonna be for a while. And she says, well, come down and join us. Um, we're, we've got some really cool work doing um, uh, health equity work in indigenous communities and you can stay in Alaska and do work as well so you can go back and forth and really excited to have Jessica Ulrich join us as well, Dr. Jessica Ulrich, um, who's joining Washington State University because she's in Washington now and all my Alaska friends, I'm like, you're stealing Jessica and I'm like, no, she's still here. We're all working together and um, we have a lot of really wonderful Alaska projects. So I serve as research associate professor and director of outreach and engagement now for 
um, the Institute for Research and Education to Advance Community Health, or IREACH. And it's been so inspiring to see my work come full circle. And now we get to look at interventional research and some of these really amazing programs and how can we take them to the next level so that they become our next best practices and evidence-based practice. And stories like Christina's and others that can help inspire that there are bright spots. And we need to focus on those. We need to focus on the good and grow the good. And um, that's going to be our focus today as we um, talk story here. And so we're going to start with Elizabeth uh, first, and then we're going to go down. Um, but the questions, and, and all three of them kind of are interrelated, and so I don't want to have them one by one. I want them to kind of come collectively and whatever comes to you. But first question is, what does care look like to you? Can you share a, a story of a time you felt cared for or truly cared about something? And what do people need to be well? So there's our, our questions, and um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Well, just what beautiful questions, too, because uh, we don't always take time to talk about them. Um, I think, uh, especially in, in the way at least I experience the world, there's so many inputs, there's so much distraction, there's so much that demands our attention that care looks like really being present. And I think Johan was really trying to root us, right, this morning, but like present in our bodies, present in our minds, present in our souls, present to other people. And um, and that's a real, it, it can be a real challenge. <laughs> um, and so, but to me, like that's probably the ultimate gift of care is to truly be present. We can't always change. Um, you know, even we're sitting with someone who's experiencing a lot of pain, we can't necessarily change the predicament that they're in or the challenges that they're facing, but we can be present with them in the pain. And um, my, I started my healthcare career in hospice, and you know, in hospice, people are terminally ill; they're they're going to die. Nothing that we're going to do is going to change that. Um, but part of what we have to learn to be is present, um, and to provide that touch, because we don't often touch people who are sick or dying um, um, or addicted. And, and so we have, that, that's, that's a gift that we can share. Uh, we don't have to go to any special schooling or is to be present, to touch, to be. Uh, and so I, when I think of care, I really think of that. Um, uh, I think that's, that's what comes foremost to my mind. I'm so excited about these questions. Uh, my neurodivergent brain is like, okay. Um, so care, I think, um, I love thinking about um, zooming in and zooming out. So when I first think about care, I think um, that um, it is so incredibly important that we think about what that means for us. What do you need um, to be cared for? So then I think about right relationship and healthy relationship and meaningful, authentic relationships and how it really does start with self and how we can't give other people something that we don't have for ourselves. And so there's that, there's that immediate... Um, and that, I'm, I don't want to tie in um, too much to the other questions, um, but what I, I think about what I need to be in healthy relationship um, with other people, and I am, I am acutely aware of how I feel in people's presence, and I think that is a really important conversation for us to have, that we think about the people who allow us to be our best selves in their presence. You know, you t um, Johan talked about um, his grandmother. I was also thinking about my grandmother, and I, also, I thought about what it would be like um, to have her in the room and how I bring her with me every Everywhere. Um, but when I was navigating through systems, it was the people who um, paid attention to me, who made eye contact with me, um, who um, saw beyond what I was experiencing, or even the behavior. You know, and that's very important that we start to understand the science of trauma and how people's behavior tell a story when they don't have that ability. And um, and really for ourselves, right? If I don't have that compassion for myself, that understanding, that patience, then I can't give that to another person. And then what's what's preventing me? And so people um, being able to have relationships and, and, um, and see what care looks like and, and
and how that feels for me on on multiple different levels. And so um, care, you know, in out beyond the medical model, beyond the clinical, beyond um, community, that every person that I come into contact impacts me. And when my heart is free and when I am present, um, then I, I am gifted a meaningful relationship. And I carry that with me whether I, I'm talking to somebody in the grocery store or I'm working as an advocate for somebody who was just sexually assaulted or if, if I'm um, meeting with somebody who um, is in hospice, you know, that I, re I remember that. I think about the things that I need and then I allow them to tell me what they need. I get very curious. I try to um, anticipate needs so people don't have to ask because I know that's hard. And um, and, and constantly in reflection and um, I think there is love languages and there are repair languages that it's not if we're going to do harm, but when we do harm, and that we're prepared to have all of those those values that we hold. Humility is so incredibly important that we know the ways that we are disconnecting so that we can understand how to connect, whether that is using someone's correct pronouns or understanding the, the importance of cultural responsiveness or um, what equity and inclusion um, and diversity and accessibility, that these are more than words and metaphors, but that they are a way of being so that we can be in meaningful relationship. And, um, and that type of work, um, when we shift, um, we don't burn out. It, it gives me energy to sit in someone's presence and see them. Um, and and beyond where they're struggling to where they can be, and and people feel that you know, and um, and it feels so good. This other this other model that's so rooted in in power and control and hierarchy, where there are those power imbalances, we will know healing by the way it feels, and I think um, that's what it looks like for me. Well, I very much struggled to separate care from love in my mind, and I think I just kept coming back to, to the idea of love. I'm also a, a new father. I have an 18-month-old. She had her checkup yesterday. She is 99th percentile chunky, so we were very, very excited about that. Um, and I, I know it is the cliche, but I think that, that that sort of love of having a new child is, is something that I certainly could not have imagined, but along with that was uh, my mom who retired from Bethel and immediately moved in with my grandmother in Montana to take care of her because she's getting older. And then when I had our child, um, daycares were shut down or impossible to get into, which is a whole separate thing. Um, so my mom figured out other siblings to take care of her mom and moved in with us for a year so she could take care of our little one. Um, so I think on a very personal level, that's, that's what care, that's what, what love looks like to me. And I, I really got to experience that and feel that. And a lot of the blessings that came along with working from home for the first year of my, my baby's life. Um, I also think about it in terms of the community I grew up in, in Bethel, and just what care looked like on a whole different level than, to be honest, I have experienced here in Anchorage for the most part. Um, and just, I mean, even sitting at my table this morning, I think there were three people who were like, oh, I'm from Bethel, and started talking about um, who people were, who we knew. But I have some stories about that that maybe I'll share later. Um, and then I think I, I saw that come about a bit during the snowstorms here in Anchorage for the first time when there was like a whole, everyone just watched out their window for the next car that was going to get stuck. And then every household like sent all able-bodied people to go push that car out. Uh, and it, it really was kind of this moment for me of like, oh, there is, that can be here, that, that community feeling. Um, and that also that that can be built, that it doesn't happen accidentally um, and I get to see that a lot through my work especially with with kids um, we get to run a program with the Alaska Native Heritage Center called the Ilaku Jalak project that connects Alaska Native youth of all different backgrounds and cultural affiliations from urban and rural and they come together and they travel to a, a new place and I when we were kind of talking about the project originally, there was a lot of like, oh, kids, they're not going to talk to each other about that stuff. They're not going to talk to each other about their culture or like really dig into those, those hard things. And that has 
not been the case. The second we we even kind of bring it up, we just get to step back and, and watch them work magic. And I'm taking notes in the background, like, wow, that's that's way more brilliant than I ever could have could have come up with. Um, so a rambling answer, but those are what comes to mind when I think of care and love. Thank you. And rambling is is a way of describing talking from the heart. And so thank you for speaking from your heart. I think that's really powerful. Um, an elder once shared with me to prepare to speak and then put your notes away and then speak from your heart. And it was really, really important wisdom to share with me and help me to connect with my voice. And we're going to do another round of talking story. I lived in Hawaii for a couple of years, and I really love that term, talking story. It's not just talking, but it's talking about things that matter. And so before we jump back to Elizabeth again, um, I want to share another Dr. Rita quote, um, which I thought was a Dr. Rita quote to start with, and then I found out it was somebody else. But she spoke it with authority as if it was hers, and she owned it, and she shared with me multiple times, and I think I needed to hear it. She goes, Gary, be who you are. Say what you feel. Those mind don't matter. Those matter, don't mind. Of course, it's Dr. Seuss, right? Um, and I was like, Rita, you had me. And she's like, you know, you, you have to speak your truth. You have to be who you are. Be authentically you. And you allow others to be authentically themselves. And as we care for others, <clears throat> it starts with care for ourselves. And I feel like many of us in health professions and healing professions get that wrong. Um, and even you know, those of us who grew up in a Judeo-Christian worldview, I remember our Christian songs, Jesus and others and you. You were last. And nothing about Jesus, because Jesus loved everybody. But it started with the great love here. And I feel like that's a really important shift that we need to take as we look at care in our communities. I see so many people who have cared to the point to where there's nothing left. They haven't nourished themselves. And that's the way to be sustainable is to, is to care for yourself, um, to take time to rest, to take time to be with your children and your family and to sit and not always be looking at what do I need to do next and, and everybody else's priorities over mine. And you know, I feel like that's a really important part as we look at caring and what caring looks like is we need to care for, for us and hold ourselves like a child and listen. You know, when your body's saying something, tune in. Like for me, I'll get a little bit of arthritis in my hands, and that tells me that I'm out of balance. I get a little bit of a skin reaction on my hand. These little things, a little bit of a crick in my neck. We all have it, right? You have those things that tell you things aren't right. And we need to teach that to everybody else around us. Our children need to grow up. When things don't feel right and they're not right, Say something and tune in. Don't tune out. So maybe a story or whatever comes to mind. And I'm going to go back to Elizabeth. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I think that I, I actually thought I was going to be a, a minister. And so I went to seminary. And, and you know, I, I'm a, I was born in Williamsburg, Virginia, and um, raised by a family that really celebrated our colonial roots. And, um, and it wasn't until I moved to Alaska and I started hearing other stories and understanding that colonialism in a different kind of way that I really started to appreciate the damage and destruction that that has caused. Um, and part of that Judeo-Christian heritage is, is this, um, is just like you said, it's it's giving everything you have, um, but but we don't fill up our tanks to be able to to do that work, and and I think um, you know and for, and in my perspective that often disproportionately happens to women, 
uh, in a way that's really destructive. Um, and so when I, when I think of like, you know, can I share a story, I, I wanted to be candid about you know, that part of my past, but also acknowledge that even at the Health Foundation, we're struggling with the fact that we have a very white dominant culture. And what does that mean? And what does it mean to really um, share power and, um, and be in community and listen? And, um, and you know, and I, I grew up, it was all about achievement, success, doing the next thing, uh, which isn't about being being present, <laughs> um, listening to yourself, your body, uh, those things are sacrificed. So I just really appreciate that you lift that up because I, I have to, I have to fight it. I have to say, well, like, wait, what, what's my body right now doing? Like, oh, I'm all hunched up. My face is tense. My eyebrows are, <laughs> uh, wait, what happens if I relax into myself and think about like you said, rooted to the to the ground, so in the earth. Um, so thank you for that because um, part of caring for ourselves is and and being whole is is in taking that time to care for ourselves. Last year was a really tough year uh, for me, uh, and I lost two members, valued members of my leadership team, um, uh, and. Um, one to illness and one to um, unfortunately destructive behavior, and it it was very very painful and it infected it impacted the entire organization, which is probably not a surprise to anybody. If you're in an organization, you see its warts and uh, uh, and everything, and, and you experience that culture in an organization, and um, it was it was very painful. Our staff felt uh, betrayed, hurt, violated. Um, there was incredible anger. Um, and uh, and it, it felt very, I felt very alone. Um, and everyone was looking to me to figure out what to do, <laughs> right? And to fix the situation, which nothing's, nothing's simple, right? You don't just get to wave a magic wand. You have to like work through this. And in the middle of all of that, my mom um, became gravely ill in Maryland and um, was dying. And it, it was just like, I, how can there be one more thing? Um, and in the middle of all of it, I had to leave to be with my mom. Um, and what what happened, the way I felt cared about was just so incredible. Um, staff members would leave me cards <laughs> and notes or little gifts um, or a poem. Um, in so many ways, the, the staff reached out to me to say, you're not alone and you don't have to shoulder this alone and there's no way one person can do this alone. One. One staff member who's now our interim vice president of programs because our, our vice president became terminally ill, um, he called me and he said, you know, Elizabeth, um, you think you have to like be strong and figure this out for everyone, but, and then he went through like team member by team member and all the gifts and graces that they have and all the different ways they could step into this space so that I could walk away to be with my mother. And it, it was just amazing. Um, and, um, and even when I was at my mom's, when I was in Maryland and caring for her in a role that I'd never played before, um, I'm not the nurse of the family or the caregiver of the family. Might not surprise you to hear that, but, um, and here I was in that role, very intimate, in, it, it was like that parent-child reversal and experiencing all of that. My board chair called me and he said, you know you don't have to come back yet. You know you can stay longer. And just to have that permission to, to be present, right, with my mom was, it was just so incredible. And to know that, um, you know, that across our whole team, everyone was pitching in so I could be with my mom, but also to get through this really difficult challenge at the staff level. And um, I'm deeply grateful for that because I, I wasn't alone. Wow. Cool.
Koyana. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that vulnerability. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to tell um, like one big story with a whole bunch of little stories, and then I want to name um, what um, what care looked like in that, um, and all being different. Um, so I get to be here because um, a woman by the name of Betty McAllister took my mother in. Um, my mother has autism and um, developmental disabilities, and she was um, struggling with um, homelessness, and, um, and she was in a um, really unsafe relationship that left um, my mother um, homeless and um, myself um, as an infant. And so she took us in and, and cared for us and allowed um, for my mother to stay connected to our culture. Just a really incredible story. If I had more time, I, I'd share the story. It's, I think it's one of the most beautiful stories that I've ever heard, and I'm grateful to be part of that. Um, but uh, Betty McAllister um, was somebody who cared for me um, incredibly. And I, I don't think that, that she really knew what it was going to look like to care for a child who had experienced physical and sexual abuse and neglect and all of those things in my behavior and I think about how um, she loved me through all of that and like um, and the way that it's so important that we understand the way that trauma shows up in the body and behavior that I would disassociate and I'd have these moments of rage and she loved me through all of those things and then later when I was experiencing homelessness here um, she got cancer and she sent for me and so my family um, um, paid the person that I owed money to a drug dealer money to get me high money to drive me to the airport Airport and um, and three plane tickets and that was I, I, I felt deeply cared for and I went through detox and I remember my grandmother Betty McAllister took me in and she asked me why I didn't come home earlier and I said that I was really embarrassed you know that I was um, that I was addicted to heroin and alcohol and my family had really invested in me and um, and I felt like I had thrown it all away I didn't understand you know the disease of addiction I didn't I just I felt very selfish and um, I didn't feel worthy of love and she told me that um, that she would love me no matter what. That she loved me my whole life. And in that moment, I realized that it wasn't just about the amount of care that I was given. It was also about the amount of care that I was willing to receive. And then from that moment, I started to undo. That I realized today that you're not responsible for that first thought. That first thought that we have comes from the conditioning, from the things that, you know, while I was out there, I was blamed for my sexual assault because I was addicted to heroin or because I was in a flop house or all these different things. I really started to shift and, um, and allowed myself to receive. I allowed myself to be a life worth saving. Um, and then I met Paul Finch, who's a physician's assistant in Fairbanks, and he taught me about the z disease of addiction, and he told me that he didn't think that I was a bad person, that I was just a person who had gone through a lot of trauma. And that was so important, that education, that was undoing, this that I, that I wasn't broken, that I wasn't a failure, that I wasn't a bad person, that uh, liberation of education. I felt very cared for. He, he freed me from some of the ways that I was thinking about myself. And then, you know, moving on, um, Rachel Brown, who was the advocate who opened the door, and um, I was very honest, and I said that I hadn't legally worked in a very long time, and um, that organization took a chance on me, even though I hadn't been employed in a long time. I felt very cared for. And when I told them um, that I didn't align with the ways that we were serving people, they listened to me, and uh, Mandy Cole, who's the executive director for the Aware Shelter in Juneau, would say that I grew them and they grew me, that I had access to community that um, that I was heard and that I was believed and then um, very unfortunately you know I, my my thought was that um, if I wasn't homeless or if I wasn't addicted that I wouldn't be harmed again um, but the truth is um, that I have a case right now for sexual assaults um, it was an IHS employee I'm suing the federal government um, right now I have a civil case um, that happened uh, two years ago and um, I was thinking about when I first came into recovery 10 years ago, I was so happy, I was so excited. I felt so free. And that was taken from me. But I'm sitting here and I'm acknowledging that I'm getting that back, that that first year, thank you. We have a rule in recovery that you don't we don't we don't save people <laughs> you know with that we don't give them tissues that we we have to feel this it's good it's honest it's raw it hurts and the only way out is through um, but during that time you know that first year I was um, I was suicidal I was angry was, I was I was beyond angry I was full of rage and I didn't want to be around people because I was afraid that 
my sadness, my anger, would bring harm to them. And I know that's not true. But I think about um, all the people that, um, I want to say this really important thing, that any time that harm happens is a reflection of community. Any time that healing happens is a reflection of community. That everything that we experience is because of that, right? That, that it is all symptomatic, that it's so important that yes, we are, um, so many of us experience these types of violence on an individual level, but it comes from something much bigger. It comes from the culture, it comes from um, these foundations, these roots of, of violence that we are ripping out by the root, that we're calling it out by name. And these last um, two years, I think about um, the people who um, continually um, call and engage um, or sit with me in my sadness or allow us. Anger is so important it, to burn it up, to release it, that we allow people to have whatever emotion that they're having and that we understand where it's coming from and that on the other side of that are all these other emotions, that our emotions are so important. Um, they connect us to our, our body. And I think that that's what it means to be an indigenous person, that we come with a lot of grief and we come with rage. And, um, and that is where um, historical and generational trauma, that's what it means is that that I have a deep sense of injustice and I know when things are not right um, or when things are um, out of alignment and that we, I'm so grateful for the, the voice. I'm, I'm grateful for people like Patty Bland and materials like Real Tools that gave me a definition for things that were just an experience for me. Um, I am I'm so grateful for um, my advocates, Warupa, um, Tolth. Um, I'm grateful for so many people who are here in this room um, who first started off as colleagues but now are, are absolutely you know best friends and that um, having those relationships you know, at the beginning of every meeting, we would pause and we would check in and we would say, and we would place relationship above anything. And that that um, that we understand that every person that we come into contact impacts our entire life, impacts my children, impacts my partner, impacts my family, and that there, um, that there is fluidity, that everything that people who are struggling need, we all need all the time. And having um, space to, to be able to say that, um, that right now I feel the freedom to speak things that I haven't been able to say for a long time, you know, that embarrassingly so, that in, um, that there was um, not that long ago that I had suicidal ideation. And um, that is so important that we say, you know, that, that we allow people um, wherever they are um, to be able to talk about the things that we're experiencing without shame, without guilt, and knowing that by speaking truth, by holding space, and by catching each other's words, I think is one of the most important things that we do, that we acknowledge and we say, I see you, I hear you, validating, normalizing, I think is one of the greatest things that we could do um, and acknowledging that if you've gone through harm, anything, that, any way that you react, totally normal totally normal. Um, and sometimes it'll be a little bit of a game. So I'll say, right, so we sometimes we see people after trauma and um, and they drink lots or they don't drink, totally normal. Um, that you would be in relationship, um, in sexual relationship with a lot of people or you can't be touched, totally normal. That you want to eat all the time or you can't eat, totally normal. Sleep all the time, can't, right? For people who clean their house um, um, again and again and again or don't have the ability to get out of bed, totally normal. Everything and in between. Um, and in that, then, then it allows us to, you know, to be as messy as we need to be, knowing that that is the way that we come to um, know who we are, know who our personality and our character is outside of trauma, that so many of the things are just reactions. Like if I poke you in the eye and your eye waters, these are reactions and that trauma is more of a wound to the body than it is a mental health issue. And learning this education um, is part of that, um, understanding the things that, that impact us. Us and, and being the people that um, that hold space. And so I want to say thank you to so many people who are in this room that allow me, again, to get to be here. Koyana. You know, I need a moment for a, a deep breath after that. Um, so I'm going to take that second. Thanks for sharing that. 
what my mind kept kept coming back to as we as I look at this question um, or think about this question um, is kind of what community care looked like and then how I was in that and my family and the and the people I loved. I was in the third ever graduating class of Ayakon at Naukovic. So that means that each year the school was literally being, they would add a grade level every year um, until it got to sixth grade. So it was truly this community-wide effort to just make it happen. Um, and the, the memory that really sticks out to me is me sitting at a table in my, my living room um, and my mom sitting next to me. My mom was a single mom raising two boys, working full time, had a full dog yard, dog mushing team. I still don't know how she did it, um, but I was sitting there doing my math homework, which was entirely in Yupik. She could not help me in any way. She did not speak a word of Yupik. Um, and she was sitting across from me and cutting out strips of paper that were the Yupik translations to the English textbooks that we had been given and literally just cutting and gluing them over top. Um, and she had a PhD in math education uh, and she never once, at least outwardly, that I ever saw or that I ever heard about was like, oh, I can help the school in this big way. I have all this knowledge. She just was there and, and she did what she could to help in that moment um, and, and was there with me. And I, I got to see that and I, I just got to be part of this true community effort to build up this this school. But it was, it was more than a, a school um, around me. And then 20 years later, I, I moved home from, from college in sunny Los Angeles where all my friends are like, you're moving where? Back to why? Uh, like I, yeah, it was so outside the realm of what any of them could imagine, um, but I just felt that I needed to, to move home and, and see what it was like to be back in Bethel as an adult. And I remember this day so clearly of, walking the, the same path to school. My mom still lived in the same house I grew up in um, to the Ayapakunet-Nalovic school, which had this one wing of the building in the, the Kilbuck school. And I remember the snow crunching under my feet as I walked the same path and, and wrapping my fingers through the, the chain link fence and just the tears on my cheeks that froze as I looked on the, the ash that covered the teeter-totter in my childhood playground. Um, 20 years of people cutting paper and elder stories and materials being built up had, had been burnt down um, and, and gone up in flame. And I, part of me is like ashamed to say how hopeless I felt in that moment. Um, and I don't think I was particularly helpful and just kind of was like, how can we ever recover from this? Like I was just kind of going around being feeling very, very discouraged that I had seen all this work um, literally go up in flame. And I remember someone just sat me down and they were like, we, we built this all before. We can do it again. It's, it's not going to be easy, but, but the building was not what this was. The materials is not what this was. It was the people and the people who were putting their time and their love into this. Um, and so for me, that was just a moment where my whole like mindset shifted um, and, and I started wanting to do work that was much more around figuring out how to work with people I was in community with um, to, to build things and do things and not to get so caught up in all the other stuff that goes on around it. Oh well, yeah. No. So, we're out of time, I think. 11 o'clock, right? Is, is that correct? So, so um, time went by really fast. Um, so, so a quote that came to mind as you were sharing from your heart, thank you. Um, beautiful stories. And we could probably talk story for a really long time. Um, but it's time for us to, to move to the next. But there's a quote that I want to share, and it's one that really resonated with me years ago when I first heard it. And it goes like this. It says, my community, my family, the people that love me know my song and remind me when I forget. And inherently within that quote is, we will forget. 
we have profound loss or something traumatic happens to us and an experience where we feel hopeless. And yet at the same time, it's those that love us, the people that know our song and say, hey, you know, I'm not seeing that same chipper um, smile or that perspective, that light that you normally have. Here, here's it back. How can I encourage you to get that bright spirit back again? And I feel like that's the role that we have when we think of wellness and prevention in this deep work of healing. It's a journey. <clears throat> and it's one that we have to be reminded that there's going to be things that come and they're going to unsettle us. And you thought you had it all figured out. And you're a teacher or you're an executive leading an organization doing amazing things and yet you're struggling with even just getting up in the morning. That is going to happen to you probably. And it's going to be us and the community and our families and the people that love each other. We're going to remind each other and we're going to hold each other up. And that's how it works. The community is meant to heal itself, but it's, it's together. It's all of us. And when you recognize and you see somebody that's down spirited and struggling, it's doesn't, you don't need to always have this profound wisdom to share with them. It's just holding space. Sometimes you don't even need to say anything at all. In fact, usually you shouldn't, yeah. right? Because the wisdom's already there. They just need somebody to hold them, hold space. Because we are all going to need that. And nobody's beyond it. I don't care what degree you have. I don't know how old you are. I don't know how much experience you have. You're going to need to be encouraged. And you're going to find a day where you feel hopeless. And it's okay. It's okay when it's not okay, Dr. Rita used to say. I'm going to have, throughout the next three days, there's going to be a ton of Dr. Rita quotes. So uh, for those of you that have hung out with Dr. Rita, it got in you, right? You could not have it not get in you. So we're going to transition. Um, and... Um, uh, basically at the tables, and I think we're going to have this facilitated, and so um, I'm going to invite us who are at the, t um, the stage now to go back to our chairs, and we're going to welcome back our hosts, and uh, Kagasukuk, thank you for letting us talk story with you and open you up today. Thank you. Wow, thank you, miigwech, all of you, for being so honest and raw and vulnerable and sharing with us. The stories were just so powerful. Um, I had a whole lot of things that I was going to say, and then just being present in that, I forgot everything. So, um, But I just really want to just really send out sincere gratitude for the, the real stories that we heard this morning, and I think that's what it's about, um, just being our authentic selves and being real and that's how we heal because I think just in hearing you all, you know, sitting on these couches, holding positions in your companies and all of these things that you do and being real and sharing how you've struggled and the things you've gone through, that's so powerful and it makes me feel more normal for having bad days and days where I can't get out of bed and when I'm struggling. So I really want to say um, big many thanks. A uh, lot of miigwetches. That's um, Ojibwe, thank you um, for sharing. And I also want to have all of us here today take some time and go inward because part of this whole um, symposium is to not just come here and take the knowledge and just go on to our merry days. We want to really incorporate what we're learning and what we're taking in and how we can incorporate that into our lives as we leave here. And so for the next um, five minutes, we're going to really ask ourselves the question, how can we care for ourselves and for others today? And so we're going to start by just quietly reflecting. You can journal if you have paper that you want to write on. And just go in and allow yourself to really be present in that question and soak up the, what that was shared here and what is coming to you. And then after five minutes, we're going to 
share with our group. So at the folks at your table, whether it's the whole group sharing or a couple of you sharing to each other, there's just power in, in allowing your voice to be heard and sharing that and having accountability for hearing, for somebody else hearing what you're saying that you're going to do today. Whether it's, I am going to drink more water because I have water in front of me or something simple like that. Um, that's totally up to you. There's no judgment. Just really taking some time to um, really think about how you're going to apply this to yourself. And while you all are doing your silent reflection, I'm going to invite Johan to come up and bless us with another song. So again, the question, how will you take care of yourself and others today? want to also add real quick um thank you all for being in this moment you know that was a very powerful panel um so yeah i just want to just again share with what um, my colleague stephanie has shared take this moment and think to yourself talk among yourself or just in your own thoughts on how do you take care of yourself you know and and i'm gonna challenge all the men too because we don't do that enough as men you know let's 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 really focus on on uh how we're gonna care for ourselves and others
All right, and now I hope you um, have been able to um, take that time to really look at yourself and go inward. And now I invite you to share with the group at the table um, some of what you were feeling, what came out, and um, just share some connections with folks. Five minutes. Hi, everyone. Yay! All right, I said I wouldn't do this earlier, but I'm going to do it anyways. Has anybody seen SNL? Yes. Okay, anybody seen the Christopher Walken skit? Okay, I know you guys don't have cowbells, but if I can get more jazz hands, more jazz hands, there we go. All right. Uh, my name is Aaron Osterbeck. I am one of the co-region chairs here for the Alliance. I represent the Anchorage uh, South Central area, and I also work with VOA Alaska. And so, sorry, I, I'm a little, I'm like five minutes behind, but it's because we're engaging in good conversation over here, and I hope everybody else has had the opportunity to do so as well. I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, folks from the coalition that I work with, and I see a lot of new faces as well. So. Welcome, um, and I'm really excited for uh, the symposium. This is my first one, by the way. So um, I'm kind of like the intermission, so I don't have anything really specific to say other than to share, uh, share a few things. Um, I will say this much, like I was listening to the presentations here, and it's so awesome to hear these stories shared out, um, very heartfelt stories, and then also uh, Dr. Ferguson, actually uh, him and I both have um, a similar, we're from the similar region, similar area. Some of our families come from Unga and from Sandpoint. And so when I heard polka, it brought back some memories, maybe some trauma, uh, more trauma than anything else. We, <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my grandparents loved uh, waltz and, and polka, um, but there was also country. So it was very, at one point in time, I was able to actually uh, radio DJ. So we got to put some like 90s music in there. Uh, would definitely encourage that down the road um, if they're not, if they're still playing polka and country. Um, anyways, uh, one of the things I was thinking about while I was, um, I'll read through the slide, the slide thing here next, but um, polka really kind of inspired some of the conversations that we were talking about earlier about grandparents. Some of my work, I spent about 15 years working with uh, elders uh, at South Central Foundation. So I transitioned over to working with youth and that's been a blessing in itself. I really appreciate that opportunity. But to work around uh, other folks' grandparents and to have, be fortunate enough to be able to um, uh, live around my grandparents and get to know them. I got to, I was fortunate enough to, to live with my dad's parents uh, throughout the summer. And then also um, because of ge geology, like Alaska being so as large as it is, I wasn't able to spend a whole lot of time with my grandparents who were up in Bristol Bay area. But as I got older, um, I was able to have that relationship with them. So um, I don't typically do this. I don't read poems, but I'm going to read one. And it's so interesting because 
well, for one, we did a retreat back in December and we had snowpocalypse, right? So I had to drive on the highway today and I seen all the snow and I was like scared that we had another snowpocalypse coming up. Uh, so this is just at random that I picked this. It's called the Lighthouse. Uh, for two reasons, um, my grandmother Marie. Um, I, so I lost both my my grandmothers during the pan uh, the pandemic. Um, one from COVID, so my grandmother Marie. Uh, the other from Alzheimer's. Um, but I wanted to list out some of the the impacts that they had, and then read this poem called "The Lighthouse" because my grandmother really loved lighthouses, and I and it reminded me also of my grandmother Nellie, um, who I felt was a lighthouse for me at one point in time. So, uh, Grandma Marie uh, believed in advocacy. She was a community member. She did a lot of work in the community. Um, really felt um, that there was a need there to support folks when they were in need. Um, <clears throat> my grandma Nellie always found humor. So this is why I can come up here with ease and share jokes and just kind of make fun of things throughout uh, things in general in life. Um, she's always laughing. Um, <clears throat> my grandpa, Alvin, who passed away, he also um, instilled with me that you can do anything. Right? He, was, he, he built boats. He was in World War II. He was a dentist, which I still don't believe, but today there are folks that still tell me that he did dental work. Um, but he also moved at a slow pace. Like I, if anything, my family would tell you and share with you that I probably move about as fast as my grandpa Alvin once did. And then my grandpa, uh, Daniel, who's still alive, uh, has inspired me to, um, and continues to instill that value of setting goals for yourself. Uh, most recently, his shared goal is that he wants to live older than his mom did. So I think she passed away when she was 104. So he says that he's going to pass away when he's 105. <laughs> so um, I think that's a, a, a very honorable goal, uh, given that uh, that that's what he set out to do right now. But he also shares a lot um, of family values. He's taught myself and. Uh, my children how to put up fish, and I think that's a very great thing to do traditionally and culturally. So with that being said, I'm going to read out The Lighthouse. So this is from uh, websites from Sarah Sarna, and this is how it goes. It goes, I am a lighthouse rather than a lifeboat. I do not rescue, but instead help others to find their own way to shore, guiding them by my example. And I think that's what my grandparents have done. I think that's what you guys are doing in this work. Um, when we talk about prevention and wellness, I hear the stories. And you're all a guiding light for the folks that you work with and the, first, the folks that you work alongside of. So thank you for that. Um, so now I'll get to the, uh, I'll get over to the slides here. So uh, it's, we're going into lunch break. So visit with one another during lunch if you haven't been visiting already. Um, Visit the exhibitor tables, so they're there uh, just throughout lunch. Take a break in the sensory room again for folks that feel like they need to take that break. Stretch your legs, walk across the street to the Kobuk for a free coffee or tea, because I know some folks don't like coffee, uh, but there will be tea there. And then that's on, um, that is on Recover, so that's on us here. And um, all you need to do is show them your name tag. So make sure that you have that over there, because I don't know if you'll get free coffee otherwise. <laughs> Just tell them Aaron sent you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I don't know. OK, here's the clicker. I think that's my only slide, but I just want to make sure. So yep, there's a beautiful scenery of the coastal line. And that is it. So uh, that is me for the day. If you would like, please show me some more. Oh, there's coffee over there. Oh, sorry. There's lunch over there. There's bathrooms over there. Thank you so much. And then. Oh, elders first, yes. And uh, also, I have a, before we leave, a blessing from Johan. So, sorry, I was just trying to get off the stage as fast as I could for the food, so. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Johan. So, more jazz hands. Oh, you got this. Oh, you got this one. All right. So before we go to lunch, I want to share a prayer song. Um, this song is sung in my village. The words you're going to hear are Nahai Gum Shlag Ikedum. In my language, that means spirit of our ancestors. Nahai Gum Shlag Ikedum. 
and when it, this the song is sung, it's sung by um, 20, 30 men. So you're gonna have to visualize how strong this this song sounds when it's being sung together. <clears throat> and we're calling our ancestors to be with us today, to to bless this moment, to to guide us, give us strength, to bless our lunch, to to bless each other. We're calling upon our ancestors to be here with us. <clears throat> Oh, oh, hey, 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 yo, ho, oh, hi, hey, hey, yay, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, hey. Let's enjoy some lunch.